All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, for joining us today uh, for our session on emerging capital sources with WeFunder. Uh, today we're gonna be talking all about community rounds via RegCF. Um, as you know, our mission at Gust is to help you get the resources you need to take the next steps in your startup. Uh, that includes funding of all sources. Um, and as you may have noticed, we've been doing more events around different emerging capital sources, including things like non-dilutive revenue-based financing, um, and today, community rounds. Uh, so we have with us today, uh, Johnny Price, who is the VP of fundraising um, at WeFunder. I think the top by numbers and volume uh, crowdfunding portal um, in the world right now. And by, and by caliber of people as well. Excellent, and I can attest to that uh, from the perspective of a Nashvillian. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it off to him. He'll give a quick overview about RegCF. Um, and we actually have the pleasure of having two founders who have gone through the process of raising a community round with us today. Uh, they'll talk a little bit about their journey and then we will open it up for Q&A. Uh, feel free to, uh, to pop questions in the chat as we go. Um, and just so you all know, we will make a recording of this available after the fact. Um, so you'll be able to rewatch it to your heart's content. Um, with all that said, Johnny, I will pass it over to you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, so as Peter mentioned, I'm just going to quickly give an overview of regulation crowdfunding um, and then hand over to Chai and Dan to talk about um, their companies and their kind of capital journeys and their experience raising on, on WeFunder. So you can hear from founders that have actually done it um, more than me, um, which will probably be much more useful for you guys. Um, I'll kind of start with two two things and kind of two, two points on, on these two things. Um, the first is um, kind of uh, what WeFunder and regulation crowdfunding is all about. And the second like, is um, why would you run a WeFunder campaign and, and who it's a good fit for? So quick overview of regulation crowdfunding. Um, most startups historically um, and still today use what's called regulation D to raise capital for investors. That means they are uh, limited to raising from accredited investors, basically rich people, millionaires. Um, Regulation crowdfunding is a relatively new exemption uh, way of raising money um, that the SEC rolled out in May 2016. And regu regulation crowdfunding allows you to do two pretty interesting things. One is you can publicly promote the offering. So rather than privately soliciting investors, you can now tell the world on social media or in a press release. You can blast an email to your customers to tell them about your um, uh, campaign. And then secondly, um, you can raise from unaccredited investors as well as accredited investors. Um, accredited investors are about 5% of the population. So now you open up uh, the opportunity to invest in your startup to 100% of the population, not just the richest 5% of the population. Um, you can raise up to $5 million per year using regulation crowdfunding. Uh, you have to conduct a RegCF campaign through a registered funding portal, um, of which there are several. Republican Start Engine are the second and third biggest. Uh, we fund as the biggest. There are many other kind of smaller platforms as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the industry, I would say, is growing very quickly. Um, we are about 4x up uh, in terms of monthly investment volume this time on, on this time last year, which is exciting for us. The rules were changed in March of this year um, to allow for SPVs, um, to roll investors up to one line in the cap table, and to allow companies to start raising on WeFunder in a matter of minutes. Previously, it was several weeks. Um, and to allow companies to raise $5 million per year. Previously, it was just 1.07 million. So three really exciting improvements that I think have made RegCF a lot more appealing to founders. So, so now we're start, starting to see like many, many more founders and later stage founders use WeFunder. We just had a company, Mercury Bank, who raised a 120 million Series B from Andreessen Horowitz and other VCs, and then opened up a $5 million allocation for their customers, like on as a bolt-on to the end of their Series B. So that kind of like stage of company probably wouldn't have used WeFunder um, a year ago. So things are changing in really exciting ways for us. It's definitely a, a pretty new and exciting just kind of space in terms of the alternative capital uh, formation space for, for you guys to be aware of, which is obviously the aim of this webinar today. Uh, two, two kind of reasons why you would run a regulation crowdfunding campaign. I'm actually curious to see how this tracks to, to Dan and Chai's reasons for, for running a WeFunder campaign. First thing I like to say is, it's an easier way to raise money. So because you can now raise from everyone, 
not just accredited investors. The accredited investors can still invest. On average, represent about 50% of investment volume when we fund it. But now you can also raise from unaccredited investors because you can publicly promote the offering. You can tell everyone about it. That should probably make it easier to raise. And then also you get in front of WeFunders investor base. We have a million registered users, half a million monthly unique site visitors. And on average, um, they're going to bring about one third of the investment volume to your campaign. So it's like if you can bring 500K from your network, on average, WeFunder will help you raise 250K from our network. So put those two, three things together, raise from everyone, not just rich people, publicly promote, get in front of WeFunder's investor base, and that should hopefully make it quicker and easier for you to raise money. The second reason people run a WeFunder campaign is to recruit an army of supporters and champions. Um, it's awesome when an angel investor invests in you a VC, they're now trying to help you whip and grow the company and lend expertise and connections and advice. Um, same thing with WeFunder, maybe in less of a deep way, because someone's just investing a thousand bucks versus a million bucks, but now there's like a thousand people that you can go to and update them on the, how the business is going, ask them for help. Maybe they can help make an intro to a customer. Maybe that if you're a consumer facing company like Move, like Chai is building, then like maybe you know they're gonna be your most loyal customers and tell their friends about it because they're proud to be an owner of Move. Um, so recruiting this army of supporters that can help you is for me kind of the second reason normally companies will run a WeFund campaign as well as just being a relatively easy way to raise money. And then last thing I'll say is kind of two, two kind of uh, framework of two things that I think like uh, are a good fit for WeFunder, who makes a good fit. Um, the first is you're a founder looking at raising 50K to 5 million. That's like basically the range we do. The minimum minimum amount that you can raise on WeFunder is 50K, max is 5 million. We do main street businesses, coffee shops, restaurants, breweries, as well as tech startups, biotech. We do B2B as well as B2C. Dan is um, B2B. Actually, when you raise on WeFunder, I think you're a hybrid B2C, B2B. Um, but B2B is certainly an awesome fit for WeFunder as well. Um, and so there's no kind of industry uh, criteria. We do you know, friends and family round, pre-seed, seed, all the way through to part of the series B. Um, you know, so it's pretty kind of diverse array of startups on the platform. Um, but yeah, 50K to 5 million is the range we do. And then in terms of like who makes a good fit, both Try and Dan have had really successful raises on WeFunder. Uh, for me, what makes a good raise, what's gonna drive success of a WeFunder campaign, I have this kind of three, three part framework. One is, is it a good investment? Right, so if your growth is up and to the right, if your total addressable market is huge, if your valuation cap on your safe is reasonable, if you're a founder with like a ton like successful exits and you know just like everything that any angel investor or VC would look for investing in startups, if you've got all that going for you, just as it will be easy for you to raise from angels and VCs, so it will be easy for you to raise on WeFunder. So like, how good is the investment opportunity of the company? Second, second thing is like how big is your audience and how quality is your audience so do you have a huge customer base that really loves your product um, so mercury had 40,000 startup founder customers they sent one email and a few hours later had raised um five million dollars um you know very very easy because they had this huge audience of tens of thousands of startup founder customers who when given an opportunity to present in them were like yep why do i sign so the size of the audience the quality of the audience and then the third thing is kind of hustle. So fundraising is usually work. Um, and so, you know, putting yourself out there, sending the emails, taking the meetings, texting people, you know, taking every podcast, taking every webinar like this one, um, you know, cadence of updates to investors, social media posts, just kind of putting yourself out there, putting in the, the effort um, and then kind of getting, getting the results um, uh, in response to that. Um, so, uh, having a great company, great audience, and then putting in the, the time and the effort and the hustle. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say, kind of high level overview on, on uh, regulation crowdfunding as a way of raising money, um, you know, why you might run a WeFunder campaign, who it's a good fit for. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to uh, Chai, let's start with you. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about um, Move and uh, your your capital journey and and the kind of regulation crowdfunding campaign as a as a part of that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll start by saying thank you for having me, everybody. Also, thank you for joining. Um, I think the big fear when you do one of these things is that all the organizers will show up and nobody else will. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to see how many people are here. Thank you. Um, you know, I, my company, as Johnny mentioned, is called Move. And uh, the way we describe what we do is we, we call it e-commerce 2.0. To us, uh, Amazon, Amazon style e-commerce was um, e-commerce 1.0, it was sort of marketplace where anybody could sell anything and just, you know, we all hope for the best. Um, and to us, e-commerce 2.0 is more vertically integrated. I call it a kinder, gentler version of e-commerce where instead of just anybody selling anything, the platform, we go directly to the manufacturers. We have them make products under only one brand, that's our brand, the Move brand. Uh, and we ship it directly to the customer, cut out all the cost centers that are baked into everyday products. We're able to make e-commerce um, a lot more economical, a lot more efficient, and I think most importantly, a lot more ethical. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, our capital journey has been, I think to date, we've raised uh, uh, just over $5 million now. And um, uh, about a, a, just under a third of that, uh, so about a million and a half of that has come from the crowd. Um, we've kind of had a unique journey. I, I think Dan might actually share uh, big parts of this. We came from a fairly uh, uh, standard Silicon Valley pedigree. Um, you know, whatever. I'm a college dropout from Berkeley. Um, we went through Y Combinator. You know, all the usual stuff that make it into a TechCrunch headline. Uh, and then I was pretty young when I started. And um, at some point in the company, I realized that the thing we were trying to do. Um, for a handful of reasons was going to take longer than the average company does. Um, it was just going to be a longer slog. It was just going to, it was just going to be more work, um, uh, more time spent um, uh, without obvious traction than the average company does. Uh, and I found increasingly that we were kind of in this strange no man's land for a bit there. It, things have changed very meaningfully now, uh, but you know, right after our seed round, we came to YC, as I mentioned, we raised a million, million and a half dollars, something like that. Um, and we just found ourselves in this place where we had raised our seed round. Um, we weren't going to have the kind of uh, explosive growth that you need for a Series A company for another two to three years. Uh, so VCs weren't really going to be uh, chomping at the bits to, to invest and move. So we had to find a way to keep the company alive, to, to make it to that point. Uh, and um, like any good resourceful founder, I, I started looking around for where to get some money to, to keep this thing alive. Uh, and I came across WeFunder. This was 2018. Uh, and uh, over the next couple of years, we ended up raising on WeFunder, as I said, a million and a half dollars. Um, in addition to that, what WeFunder did, actually, you know, I should have maybe started off by saying uh, it's my, my minor conflict of interest here is that I love WeFunder. And I love equity crowdfunding and I love Johnny uh, and I love everybody that works at WeFunder. Um, so I don't know, that's a moral conflict of interest. I can't be totally unfair. I can't be totally fair about this. Um, but, you know, what WeFunder did for us and what equity crowdfunding did for us was at a time when traditional VCs wouldn't touch us, um, it gave us uh, a, it gave us money, which was important. It gave us this incredibly passionate community of customers. Um, I have stories for days. I would get emails from truck drivers in Idaho to investment bankers in New York, and I still do, uh, who would talk about how much they loved Move, and uh, they would say, God bless you all, all these really incredible things that I would never have encountered if it weren't for, if I was just in my little San Francisco bubble raising from my little San Francisco friends. Um, and I just think it, it gave us uh, money at a time when we needed it, it gave us emotional support at a time when we needed it, uh, and it gives an incredible community. That's how we. That's how it started. Now our fortunes have turned uh, quite well. We've been able to get to the the promised land that we had uh, been thinking about for a while. We feel like we've been able to prove a lot of the things that investors wanted to see. And now VCs are quite willing, or much more willing than before, to to give us money. And uh, my only condition to them when we're negotiating with Series A investors or these you know larger firms as Tier One folks is you gotta let me always do an equity crowdfunding campaign because we're gonna do one every single year until I or the company dies. Uh, and um, that's, that's, that's what it's become. It started off as just a way to survive, but now it's become a critical part of our strategy. Um, we've, we see ourselves as the first, as part of being e-commerce 2.0, is having a different model for ownership. Um, it's not surprising that e-commerce 1.0 created the richest man in the world. 
Um, to me, the question is, can we create the richest community in the world through e-commerce 2.0? And um, so it, both morally and functionally in every way I, uh, it, it, that matters, um, I think equity crowdfunding was the right choice for us. We're going to continue to do a campaign forever. Um, I'll stop there. I could, I, could, I could write more love letters, but I'll, I'll pause there. What's uh, anything to, I should add, Johnny? That's really awesome, man. One thing I'll just kind of uh, double down on what you're saying about the richest community in the world. I love that. A kind of 2.5 to my framework of why you might raise a we funder so make it easier to raise capital. Sounds like that was applicable for you. Like it was early, long term time horizon. And so VCs went maybe throwing money at you in 2018. And so now they're starting to do more and more as you've like delivered and executed on the money you raised from the crowd. So sounds like that was applicable. Like, okay, helped you raise some money, recruited an army of champions. The 2.5, which I didn't really normally kind of talk about at a high level, the, the, the starting point, but you went there, so I'll just double down on it. It's like if you slave away at building a company for 10 years, you know, and like create a ton of value for like the owners of that company, like do you want to like create value for like, you know, some some rich people? Nothing on the rich people, but like wouldn't it also be cool as well? Uh, to create a ton of wealth for the people that were there with you as your customers on day one, or the Idaho truck driver, um, or that investment banker in your <laughs> But like, you know, uh, kind of creating creating value for your community as well as VCs, I think it's cool. I, I give this one story of Jason Calacanis invested 25K in, in Uber. I don't know, Peter, if we're allowed to use uh, other names of other prominent angel investors um, other than David, yeah. but I'm gonna go there. Uh, so he invested 25k in Uber seed round, made 125 million in the IPO, 5,000x, and it's like he was already a millionaire. What if that 125 million had been split around uh, 200, uh, 125 people investing $200 each, and we created 125 new millionaires? Like if move makes it big, the the middle income like Idaho truck drivers that got into move seed round will become millionaires, and I just think that's like really cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild to think about. And I think one of the fun and interesting things in the space is seeing how all of this plays out. You know, I think the people who invest in crowdfunding campaigns that don't come from the traditional VC background aren't necessarily looking for the types of returns that are necessary to make traditional VC viable. Um, and with that comes a, a totally different potential direction for the companies too because they're not necessarily having to hit those same multiples. But it doesn't mean that they won't. They just don't have to. Um, and if they do, it's very possible that, you know, democratization of investment is also democratization of returns. And that is something that's really cool and exciting. Um, Chai, one question I have for you, because it's one we get a lot um, from, you know, the angel and VC community and from founders is, what was it like kind of navigating as you were talking to you know, more traditional investors about wanting to continue the crowdfund? Was it a relatively easy conversation to have? Were there any like points you actually had to, to push back against? Was there anything that, that made you think like, or actually like question that path? Yeah, um, that, that's a really good question. Um, I'd start off by saying, uh, my answer would have been different if we were having this conversation in 2018. Uh, it has continued to get um, easier and better to have these conversations with investors. Um, honestly, I, I, I felt a little bit like um, a, a, like a badass uh, in the early days of this, talking to investors because they really didn't want us to do this. Uh, but what's happened over time, as in the time that we've been on WeFunder and kept doing this, it's become the stigma has gone away. Um, WeFunders, of course, become a very big company. Uh, and I think investors have gotten much more used to this. Also, structurally, it's gotten a lot more, um, a lot easier to handle. It used to be that everybody would be a single line on their cap table. Now it's become one line on the cap table. So I think increasingly it's gotten easier and easier and easier. Uh, you know, momentum in some ways matters more than where you are. Um, and the momentum is in the right direction, number one. Number two, I would really argue at this point, it's, it's gotten to a place where they don't even really care. Um, we've gone through due diligence with some, you know, the, the tier one folks and uh, no one flagged it as a, as a problematic thing. To them, it's, you know, you, you did what you had to do. If, if anything, I kind of use it as a positive signal now. So I bring it up often and I talk about how, you know, one time we opened up, allowed our customers to invest and to put $200,000 in, in an hour. 
and that became very uh, so it's, it's become i use it as a bit of a positive signal um but yeah i'd say it was used to be hard now it's become a lot easier um did that answer it yeah absolutely and it's great to hear um and i think one of the most exciting use cases is this kind of like pre-vc money to tackle like moonshot ideas that mm -hmm. that won't won't get the funding from the normal track, but have a broad appeal to a large customer base. And I mean, it's it's also awesome when it has overlap with a really wonderful mission. Thank you. I'm, I'm not to sorry, not not to drag this out. I've, I've outspoken my time here, but I should just add that I think, especially if you're a company um, like us that uh, has a lot of stakeholders, uh, it is an especially wonderful and effective idea to do this. Um, in our case, for example, we, we, with our supply chain, um, uh, we were basically able to get our entire supply chain invested in the company. Um, uh, delivery drivers who deliver for Move, to people who work in our warehouses, to people who do customer service for us, um, they're all invested in the company uh, through our WeFunder campaign. And what that does is it, it creates a, just an ambient incentive for everybody um, to work a little bit harder to make this thing work. Um, which is, again, so if you have a company with a lot of stakeholders and a lot of, uh, which I think most of us do, um, and uh, a lot of people that get involved, you know, if you're not a company that is going to sell to one big client forever, um, it especially makes a lot of sense. So just wanted to add that. All right. We do have one question in here um, around whether or not you had a, a minimum investment in, the, I guess, the initial crowd campaign. Barbara, if you have any, um, any clarification on that, feel free to, to keep popping questions in. Yeah, um, in the very first campaign, we set it at $100, um, which I think at the time was WeFunder's minimum too, I, I might be wrong, but um, we later on increased it to $250. That was, you know, for just kind of internal company reasons, uh, we just we found that it was easier to, to manage, um, but that's it. We've kept it at $250 ever since then. Um, and uh, again, depends on the type of company um, you are. I highly encourage people, I think, if you're going to do crowdfunding, do crowdfunding properly, which I really recommend doing a, a lower cap. You just open up the size of your community more. So anyway, that's that's just my opinion. It worked out well for us. We've done awesome. it twice. We've done one at uh, $100 minimum and the second one at, at $250 um, for similar reasons. Seamless segue, Dan, do you want to um, tell us about what you're building at Regrand and um, your kind of similar capital journey yeah yeah no, and, and uh, echoing the thanks for uh, everyone who's who's here with us i think this is a you know i don't beyond think i, I have a lot of conviction that this is a huge part of the future of, of the financing of you know the you know, next great companies uh, you know in, in the world here um, i'll dive into our, our journey in, in a little bit but a bit about regrand we are a food company or food technology company uh we have a, a pretty simple vision for for the world we believe that we should be eating all the food that we're growing, plain and simple. You know, we waste way too much, way too much edible food, and um, you know, there's there's a huge opportunity to, across the triple bottom line. You know, the people, planet, and profit to to close that loop and do something better. So, you know, got my start in this. Um, it's kind of a homegrown, home home brew operation. I was I learned how to brew underage when I was in in college. Um, I uh was making beer every week he used about a pound of grain for every six pack of beer i started making loaves of bread to sell to friends and so the first iteration of the business was really a hobby business and it was cash flow funded so we'd you know sell out a batch use the proceeds to buy another sheet pan so we could make another batch of you know bread and, and the idea uh quickly became this platform to connect the dots between what we saw is a very latent supply chain, the tens of billions of pounds of brewer's grain that um, is out there generated by the commercial brewing industry and uh, large scale food manufacturers that are creating products um, that increasingly are you know, aiming to target you know, better for you, better for the planet type claims that, that the customers are ultimately looking for. Um, you know, we today are, are doing that. You know, we're working with, with big, big food companies, big breweries, we've had, uh, you know, fast forwarding to our capital structure today, we've got strategic investors um, actually that make up our, I would argue our entire cap table. So we've got the uh, Molson Coors Brewing Company has invested in us, uh, Bar Barilla, the Italian food company has invested in us, um, Griffith Foods, who's kind of a, a B2B you know, food company. There's a retailer out of Japan called Oisix that's invested in us. And I believe that equity crowdfunding is actually strategic capital as well. And We've uh, taken every opportunity to incorporate that, you know, into into what we do. Starting from 
even before equity crowdfunding, we did a rewards-based crowdfunding campaign back in 2015. We had a consumer line of products that we're using to kind of test and learn in the market. We we're making nutrition bars, um, you know, snack, snack bars that we were selling to teach people about upcycled foods, to teach people about what we were doing with Regrained. And we did a, a you know, rewards-based campaign to, you know, basically a sales event, right, to, to back that in 2015. 2018, we did our first uh, equity crowdfunding campaign where we blended uh, the Reg D and the Regulation CF crowdfunding. So, and, and this is a strategy that we mirrored when we did our, our WeFunder round in, in 2020. So we've always seen equity crowdfunding as a part of the capital stack. You know, so we, uh, you know, had other lead investors that could validated what we were working on. And we wanted to create an opportunity to really align this you know, an ecosystem from supply chain through to shopping cart, as we like to say, kind of similar to what uh, Rakhai was saying. And so the, you know, the, the crowdfunding events created this opportunity to engage uh, a broader community. Our first campaign was, 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 was pretty successful. We raised um, about three quarters of a million dollars. We we're one of the first, like, was one of the, I think at the time it was the biggest like food company, you know, regulation CF type type raise that was happening. So still really early on, back in the days when you had one line on the cap table for every single one of these uh, uh, investors. But importantly, and this hasn't been covered yet from a governance perspective, it was also really attractive for a mission-led founder like like myself because you don't, uh, while you give up ownership in the business anytime you sell equity, you don't give up uh, control. Right, and so with the uh, the first class of uh, equity crowdfunding, we did, uh, you know, we actually had a, a proxy assigned to our existing board, you know, for those votes, and then on the WeFunder round, you know, it's done through a through a lead investor who we, you know, we, is a strategic you know, decision, not just the masses deciding what's going to happen. And that's a really important clarification for those who are going to think about also raising for more traditional capital to to be able to speak to how these investors are actually an asset and a strategic, you know, part of your plan, and not, uh, you know. A, a comfort uh, to the governance of the you know of the business. Uh, our first equity crowdfunding campaign led to one of our first institutional investors who uh, converted our notes and, and led us into a priced round. We then um, you know operated for another few years and opened up another round. We brought in a lead investor um, and then tagged on the equity crowdfunding as a carve out you know from from that round. And the thinking there was it would. We didn't know how much of the round it would take, and we had some, based on some older securities laws, we had some limitations around where you know, how much we could actually raise under under Reg CF uh, at, the, at the time, and a lot of that's gotten gotten easier since then. Um, but the thinking was that we, you know, as much as we could raise through equity crowdfunding, the better, because we want to democratize, you know, our mission and our success, and you know, create an opportunity to do that, and so we. We've raised also about $5 million, um, including a little bit of debt and you know, equity crowdfunding is represented about one and a half of that and fully intend to uh, you know, continue to, to, to offer it uh, you know, as in, in future rounds. We've got probably one more big round ahead of us. And you know, big, big believer in the invest, similar to, to what, what I was saying about the uh, hearing from different investors in different ways. Like when we've launched different products or had you know partners that have launched different products using our ingredients, it's always this, you know, the list of, of equity of our of our investors that we hit up first. We we share uh you know, we try to share lots of updates. You know, it's easy to share the good the good news, but sometimes when you're going through something, and we've had multiple times where we've been going through stuff and we've asked for help too. Hey, can you help us find an expert in this or that? And it's been a really great asset, you know, in that in that respect too. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll leave it there. There's a, there should be a link coming through in the chat with a, a piece that we collaborated with, uh, with Forbes on, you know, with some just advice about how to execute an equity crowdfunding campaign. Um, and, you know, also echoing, like, I, I do feel like I have a bias to, to, to WeFunder, you know, <laughs> it was a great, especially having had the contrasting experience with another platform previously, um, you know, the team, the team really knows what they're, you know what they're doing there, and they're at the at the leading edge of of where this form of venture capital is is going, and it's something that I think you know all founders should take a look at. And then the oh, one more thing that that I'll mention, which you know isn't uh, may sound you know I'm, I recognize I'm saying this as a you know a white male founder, right? I meet the the, the classic like archetype, but I think there is a really uh, powerful opportunity through equity crowdfunding to uh, for you know more diverse founders also to to reach uh, capital that they might not otherwise you know, be able to and actually have community finance and I you know that's something that um, 
I think from a like a social mission, you know, aspect, you know, of it is 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 really powerful and should be, um, you know, this isn't just for one type of, of of founder. You know, there's a there's lots of reasons why this can bring a lot of benefit to to a lot of founders and the the communities that they're from. Yeah, and I think what we've often seen when that that topic is discussed, that one of the key components is building up the investor base that recognizes the value and isn't pattern matching against their all of their previous history. And I think that's one piece of leverage that you know crowdfunding and publicly raising um, really has a has a leg up. Um, it's a whole new class of investors that is by definition uh, way more inclusive and diverse. Um, all right, we have a bunch of questions. Um, so let's see. The first question is uh, around the the difference um, or any different treatment in terms of those minimums. And this it seems like this may be uh, just a misunderstanding between equity crowdfunding and rewards based crowdfunding. Um, but we have a question: Did you offer anything to the crowdfunders who gave two hundred fifty dollars rather than one hundred dollars? Were there any difference in terms? Yeah. So well, my take on on perks, which is probably part of what people are, are asking about here, because there are often like, oh, you invest this much and you get a T-shirt or or whatever. I really encourage founders to not think too much about the the perks as it relates to Reg CF crowdfunding. You are offering an investment opportunity, and they're going to invest as much or as little as they're able to if they're bought into what you're what you're doing and the different offerings, you know, between tiers. You know, it's not. It's just going to create work on the back end for you guys, where you could just be, you know, running running a business, not like a, a swag shop. Um, but the and then in terms of terms, no. And we actually one of the things I think was attractive about our raise is that we offered with some some nuance around just the type of of, of investor that that a reg CF investor is, almost identical terms to what our lead investor um, had done for that round. So they were able to come in and say, oh, you know. This uh, it was Molson Coors. You know, Molson Coors has invested and set these terms. I get to invest at these terms. You know, again with some nuance and, and some of the differences there. So did not stratify the um, you know preferences or you know, anything like that um, for the the investors. One thing I would just kind of caveat a little on the perk side. I think especially for B two B, like really agree with what Dan said. I think you can do cool stuff. Like if it's like if someone invests five k, then Maybe they come out and see the see the manufacturing facility, and that's a way for you as the founder to build a relationship in person with that investor. But they feel like they're getting a perk, but really you're also getting a benefit because you're kind of getting like FaceTime and deepening that relationship. Another example I think of is like with a consumer-facing business is like basically a discount on the product. So if it's an investor, I get 10% off, or I, I don't know if you, I'm curious to hear what you, what you did at Move Chart, I can't remember, but like if you get a 10% discount off the product, your gross margins that you're making as a, as a company are like way north of that. So you're still in the black uh, on the unit economics, but that's gonna drive volume and revenue. They, the, the investor feels like they're getting a benefit, so they're more likely to invest, but then they're also, that's also gonna drive your revenue so if you can give away a perk that it isn't to Dan's point like t-shirts eh, doesn't really I wouldn't recommend that but if it's like you can give away a perk that like both will drive capital but also actually is perfectly in line with like just the normal like growth of your business I think that's the sweet spot yeah, yeah and that's, I, that's really interesting oh so sorry go ahead oh no no no, no, no worries at all um yeah I'm, I'm I kind of agree with both of you I uh uh, we sort of did an in-between thing. We, um, I agree with Dan completely. I'm very anti-swag. Um, one of the things we get paid for as a company is to put our logo on things. And if we start giving it away for free, and I think this is in some, at some level, every company gets paid to, to put their logo on something. Um, and so we were very anti that. But what we did find was we're a members only model. Um, and we felt like uh, as part of the investment, we could give you a free year membership or if you invested more, free couple of years, free three years. And that's just for my core part of the business, we didn't have to set up a separate swag arm or do anything too custom. Uh, and it worked out really well. And those customers, we've got about, I think, 13, 1400 now, we fund our backers. They've gone on to be some of our highest spending um, customers on the store. Um, and there was no extra cost to us to, to give, um, uh, I guess it was some opportunity cost. We could have made some membership dollars, but who cares? Uh, and so we let these folks in and uh, yeah, they're some of our most loyal backers. They spend most. Uh, they spend the most aggressively. They spend the most money. 
Um, they, they help uh, boost our numbers quite a bit when we're talking to regular VCs. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of doing things that are core to your business uh, and that you can easily create. They're just a byproduct of your business. You should introduce those as perks. But I agree, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to, uh, to build up something totally custom. Um, I, I, ju I just think that could be a waste of time. I actually did a blog post, um, I don't know if we can share it, um, I did a blog post where I looked at one consumer facing company that like all of their sales were kind of online and so they have pretty good uh, data on this, uh, which they anonymized and then shared with me and I looked and it's like they had a bunch of people that were not previously customers that invested in the WeFund campaign and then made their first purchase and then went on to be spending tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and then also if you looked at the existing customers and you compared existing customers who invested with existing customers before the campaign who didn't invest, the ones that invested went on to basically have a much higher LTV kind of in the in the next kind of months and years. And so it was a data driven kind of example of what Chai's talking about there of like, you know, that the, your investors are going to be your best customers. Awesome. Thanks all. That was all really interesting perspective. And I, I love the idea of offering perks that are in line with uh, your business or the traditional business model or even the traditional investment experience, right? It's like crowdfunding happening all online. It's a little different than the traditional meet and greet. So if you can structure your perks to kind of loop it back to that more traditional, like high touch investor relationship, that can be really cool. Um, or if you can use it to really amplify your customer base, that's that's a great way to, to look at it. I can actually provide a quick, interesting example closer to what Johnny was talking about is non-traditional tech startups. Uh, I invested in a company called Death and Company, which is known for a Manhattan bar that was like a super exclusive speakeasy thing, but they were expanding to international hotels and they were trying to become a much bigger thing, but it's not going to be a tech startup. I just like the people, my girlfriend and I love the food and beverage space. And I was like, ah, well, let's give this a shot. They included with a certain investment level, basically priority reservations. And that place was known for having a huge line out the door, never taking reservations, like first come, first serve only. And that was one of the things where one, it's all about kind of like the brand that they sell. Is this exclusivity? Is it this, you know, kind of this atmosphere? And it was, it was a fantastic perk in like, I probably go there now more than I ever did before, even though I was a bit of a regular. Uh, but it's just because like it's there and I'm probably like a power customer for them. Yeah, I think one theme here is maybe like creating an opportunity for engagement with these investors post round. And you know, if you do that well, like you know, for us, we so we've done it twice and our, our we initially opened up the second crowdfunding round private like privately, you know, quasi privately to the first round investors as an opportunity to follow on. And I'm sure there's, there's things that we can be doing better in terms of how we engage the investors, but it was, you know, we had numerous examples of investors who maybe put in 200 bucks the first round and up the ante to, to 200, or sorry, to, um, to 10,000, 5,000, you know, like adding zeros to their, to their checks. Like we had a lot of that happening with the investors, you know, in their, in their follow on rounds and, you know, having, uh, you know, opportunities to creating opportunities to, engage with with your investors after the the raise should be that's where like they become strategic investors awesome all right uh, a couple more um would you recommend this for a social enterprise and do you believe that you need a huge pre-existing network uh to make this work i can uh, I, I can add a little bit of context there uh, i think like, like with anything it, i think it depends what type of social enterprise uh but uh uh, by and large, absolutely. I mean, if anything, I would especially recommend it for a social enterprise. I think uh, um, uh, you ideally want to be innovating. Not we think of ourselves as a social enterprise. Um, uh, we could disagree about that, but I, you know, I think uh, uh, you want to be innovating not just on what the product is, but also how you're creating that product, how you're creating a uh, business around that product. And I find that uh, I I recently did uh, by the total sidebar um, because Dan mentioned the Forbes article. Crowdfunding is also a fantastic opportunity for um, for press coverage. Uh, we got our first Forbes feature because of our crowdfunding campaign. Recently got it on Business Insider because of our crowdfunding campaign. Um, on and on, it's just been a, several meaningful features here. Uh, but coming back to this, um, I think that um, you know one one of the things that I, I I said in all of those articles, and I'll say again, is I think it's not just the um, economically effective thing to do; it's also the morally right thing to do. 
um, is crowdfunding. So I would especially re recommend it for a social enterprise. Um, I think another benefit for a social enterprise is that in addition to you know this being the right thing to do, it's that um, you know people are less, uh, as, as I think Peter mentioned, that people are less um, um, stringent about needing to see an immediate profit uh, or needing to see an immediate return in the same way that I think a, a lot of traditional investors are. So I think um, absolutely, I would I would highly recommend it. Uh, I, I hope that answered the question, by the way. If not, please give it another comment and I can try to explain that more. I think another awesome. interesting angle that we've heard is one of our Gus Launch customers, we actually did a case study on him a month or so ago, did a crowdfunding round and specifically made it, his uh, application was in the data privacy. And he made it explicit in the crowdfunding round that, hey, if I go the VC route, you know, and I raise money from entrenched interests, which are basically invested in companies that make a ton of money off of data selling, I'm going to have my cap table, you know, almost like there could be people on my cap table that are counter to what my company's mission is. So I'm going to raise from the people who I basically want to provide service to and protect their data and not have them think I have entrenched interests because I have Facebook's whatever, you know, Sequoia thing on my cap table. Yeah. And All right. to the there's a second part of that question about the existing network too that I think is a really yeah. important question. Um, it, I mean, the, the bigger the better, right? I mean, we're talking about the, tapping into the crowd, but if you don't have a big network, you need to have a plan uh, leading up to your raise to get in front of, you know, what I would think of as like leveraged opportunities where you can go one to many. And so there's a lot of these uh, networks and things like that now of uh, investors and, and like the folk, you know, the good folks at, you know, at, at, at WeFunder can potentially help make some introductions or you can, you know, do some of your own research. You know, there's like angel, angel networks effectively that are of these like micro angels that look at, that look at these things. And so giving yourself, a, you know, as much time as possible in the kind of um, like incubating period of your raise where you've got everything ready to go, it's live, but it's not public. And then getting uh, in front of these audiences where you can maybe give one presentation and then uh, you know, to give a real example, we did one uh, in our in our WeFunder campaign that after that uh, presentation had had gone live within 24 hours, there was another 250, 300 thousand dollars in the in the campaign. Like moved the needle by a lot. And so there's there's definitely ways to get in front of um, you know more more people, and you just need to plan to then have for when you go live. To have that kind of momentum, you know, already built in, and those proof points that like other people have seen this, they believe in it, they've invested in it. Maybe you're already at, you know, 200, 300k before it goes live to the to the broader public audience. And so then, when new eyes that maybe have no connection to your company get to it, they've they've got those reasons to believe uh, right there. And so, yeah, I don't know what and Johnny, you probably, you, I'm sure you have a perspective on that. But. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of points. Uh, great questions. Uh, WeFund is actually a public benefit corporation and a B Corp. So we love like, you know, I think I agree with Chai and Dan is you're a, a PVC, a B Corp? Yeah, yeah, we all we are, we are as well. Yeah. So I think social enterprises is a great fit. Um, I think a lot of investors in WeFund will probably see themselves as impact oriented. That's one of the really cool things I think about this model is like, if a VC is investing their LP's money and writing a million dollar check, they're very kind of going to be narrowly focused on generating financial return for their LPs. That is their fiduciary responsibility. If like individual people are investing hundred dollars in companies that they know the founder or they like the cause, they think there's a lot more kind of scope for the uh, accommodation of more kind of nuanced uh, motivation. So I think social enterprise is a great fit. And on the audience side, yeah, I agree with Dan. Obviously, the, the bigger the audience, the better. And we funders raised through RexCF ourselves. We raised five million. When the when the cap lifted, we did a five million RexCF campaign ourselves. Um, and you know, we have like a million registered WeFunder users, and our CEO sends one email and raises five million bucks, right? Mercury Bank sends one email, raises five million bucks in a few hours, you know. Obviously, the bigger audience you have, the higher quality audience you have, the better. Um, but if you're a pre, you know, early in FDA approval trials, biotech company with zero audience, but you know, your last company exited to Novo Nordisk for 200 million and you just graduated from Y Combinator and blah, 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 you know, then you can also raise very, very easily on WeFunder. Um, and there's, 
you know, um, so you don't, you definitely don't need an audience. Um, we've had many companies run very, very successful campaigns um, without having a massive audience. But yeah, as Dan mentioned, it definitely doesn't hurt. Uh, I think this next question actually dovetails into that uh, nicely. Um, and Dan, you touched on this a little bit. Um, but can you both walk through a little bit the process of going from, you know, conceiving of entering into like a Reg CF offering through kind of testing the waters through to launching to the public, what that process is like, uh, how long it potentially takes at each stage? Yeah, yeah. caveat, I, I'd be interested to kind of hear Dan and Chai's take on this, but caveat, the process has changed pretty significantly with the new laws that the FCC rolled out in March which allow for testing the waters now. So I'll maybe kind of be curious to hear from you guys on your own journey and timeline, um, but then I'll maybe give us a slightly updated answer um, at the back end. Um, my experience has been, um, it's as Ani said, it's, uh, it's gotten faster and faster uh, recently. Uh, I would also say, I, I really think the WeFunder team is, is uh, the, probably the best people to talk to about this. Uh, in my experience, it, it takes i would bank about a month um uh, not not just for the, the paperwork the paperwork is actually pretty fast but a, i would give yourself a month to work on the campaign um tell the story exactly how you want get it right and then just get it out i definitely think there is such a thing as uh, over optimizing uh, on this campaign and and trying to get too far into the heads of what people are going to want to see um i think a, a really important detail i would i would really say work on the campaign give yourself a month maybe if you're uh, less of a procrastinator than i am then give yourself two weeks or something get the campaign out there start to collect some data and then improve it over time um but yeah i think the actual paperwork is, has always been surprisingly light to me and uh, platforms like wefunder republic they, they tend to help i've never done a campaign outside of wefunder but i'm assuming they do this too um they, they help you out um with the, a lot of the paperwork so uh, i wouldn't let that be a consideration uh, in deciding whether or not to run an equity crowdfunding campaign you can probably get out to market pretty quickly uh, the big, um, uh, the big time differential really will just be how much time you want to spend writing the campaign. That's that's really it. Yeah, and are you already raising, right? In which case you have assets that you've developed, you know, ostensibly for for that raise, right? And that makes it a lot faster. Um, so, you know, I think that's a that's a consideration there. You know, my in our experience, like the you know the, the WeFunder team was able to match the pace that we that that we wanted to to set with that. There's some things. Um, and this is part of what Johnny's going to get into, where if you have to do a, a third-party audit, you know, that used to slow things down a lot. Um, but it's, uh, you know, a lot of people like ask me about the kind of a related point to this about like the efficiency of raising this. And they're concerned basically about how much work it's going to take to successfully pull off a, a campaign. And it's interesting because like a lot of the work, you, you do need to put, put maintenance work in throughout the campaign, but it's, it's very front-loaded and actually becomes a very efficient campaign you know if you if you have uh, a decent amount of time to put into it i think you could uh, easily launch in inside a month um you know you might put you know 30 hours into it or, or something like that as the as the founder um i don't know i've actually never tried to quantify that before so that could be totally off but you know, it's just my my you know my sense of it. you're not gonna be spending all of your time uh, on that but a, a, a big chunk of it for that for that month um and then, you know, ideally you've done a great job and every time you refresh the page, there's more money in it. You know, it actually becomes very efficient, uh, you know, once 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 you've launched. Um, so that's kind of the other you know, side to it. But, yeah. And you get an email saying, hey, so-and-so just invested in you. And the, here's a nice note that they wrote about why they love Move or why they love Regrind. Um, yeah, so quick update. So the law change in March increased the cap to $5 million per year. Uh, we can now use an SPV to roll investors to one line on the cap table. Previously, we were using a custodian. SPV is slightly kind of more familiar legal instrument. Um, but yeah, like the, the thing that's relevant for this question is um, you can now do what's called testing the waters. Um, so you can basically um, launch a campaign very, very quickly. It, when Chai and Dan um, did it, um, they needed to get uh, independent CPA and accountant to do a review of their financials before they could file the legal paperwork with the SEC, which was needed as a prerequisite to then starting to fundraise. And getting that review done, like especially if your finances are in a mess, might have taken a couple of months and cost five grand. And so, you know, and then there's other stuff as well. And so 
it just kind of really pushes out the timeline before you can pull the trigger and go live. Um, and now you still need to do that stuff before you get the money, but you can now parallel process that with um, uh, launching the fundraising campaign much more quickly. So if you have a pitch deck good to go, you can literally be live on WeFunder in half an hour and then you're starting to send it around. People get, get feedback. Hopefully they give you feedback. You ask them for feedback. They give you money, that famous quote. And so you're starting to raise like kind of MVP, lean startup style immediately. Um, and then in parallel, you get the financials done and you do the legal paperwork and file the form C with the SEC that we help you with, et cetera. Um, but you can kind of parallel process as opposed to do it in series. So it is a lot more quick and easy to get going. And, you know, it, some, as the name implies, what would the SEC, I think, we're trying to do with testing the waters is sometimes you don't know if you're going to be successful. And for some companies, like this can be a way to kind of feel it out and pitch investors. And it's it's almost like if if I'm not, if investors aren't picking up what I'm putting down, then maybe I don't need to pay the accountant to do the CPA review. Maybe I don't need to worry about the legal paperwork. I'm only going to incur that, that cost and invest that time if, well, yeah, this is going great and this is exactly what I hope for okay now let's like invest in the legal and financial uh, stuff nice um, and I think this one is is semi related um, in terms of negotiating terms uh, or setting terms for for a community round uh, what was that process like uh, did you do that with uh, perhaps like a, a lead investor prior to opening up the, the CF portion of the round or how did you think about setting the terms in your in your CF round um, the, the quick thing I would say about this, I, I love, I think Dan mentioned this too, is uh, um, if you already have investors and you've raised from them recently, just give the community the same term. So you're giving your regular investors. Um, yeah, uh, just simplifies the process, um, it reduces the amount of explanation you need to do on it. It's also, again, just the right thing to do. Um, now, if you don't have an investor, um, uh, what I would really say is, this is probably the thing you get the most questions on. Um, at least in my experience, it was constantly a thing we were getting questions on if we funder. Uh, and so just just have a defensible story. Just have a good explanation for how you got to evaluation. Um, and uh, what we did was I had the three, when we had traditional investors, we still got a, a lot of these questions. And I had sort of a three-pronged approach. I said, look, um, here's how we justify the valuation cap we're raising at. Uh, number one, here are some other companies that do similar things that just raised. Uh, and these are the valuations they raised at, link to articles. Um, these are the standard revenue multiples that companies in our space are raising at. Um, and finally, we would say, well, we just took this check a year ago when we were doing zero dollars in revenue. Now we're doing ten dollars in revenue. So hence, uh, um, hence our valuation should be this much higher. Um, so I would say just have a clear, defensible story for it. The wrong thing to do. Now, I'm, I, I, I'm sure the person that's asking the question wasn't thinking this, but uh, I, sh I should say because I've seen it happen is the wrong thing to think about equity crowdfunding is, oh, I could just get by with any terms, right? Uh, that is that is just incorrect. Um, you can't. The, these people are they're, they're new to investing, but they're not idiots. Um, they're they're going to grill you on it and have something that you can you can defend. Um, also, you'll just feel better about yourself. So that's what I was saying. Yeah. Quick plug for Gus. We do build some tools that help you think about these things in a structured manner. Um, so at least you understand how to put together a good story. Thinking about your team, thinking about your traction, looking at potential revenue multiples and things like that. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Here's another good one. Um, how did you think about traction? And again, related. Uh, how did you think about traction uh, when you were approaching your CF round? And any opinions on how much traction you should achieve prior to um, considering a CF round? Yeah. So it's, I'll, I'll take first stab at this one. I mean, it's a critical part. Traction is a critical part of the story, right? But it's not the same for for every company. Um, you know, for, for Regrained, what we're focused on, you know, big picture has these really long, hairy deal cycles. Um, two, two, three years from when we meet a company, they'll start producing uh, products using our ingredients and, and, and generating revenue. And so we weren't able to come into these rounds with these, you know, this very clear story of, of revenue, you know, for, for traction. But there was qualitative things that, that, that we could talk about. For example, we have technology that we have. A, the, was a, there was a patent, you know, that was awarded to us. Like we own a, a patent, right? That is uh, that is an example of like qualitative traction, you know, for for your business. We're working with some of the biggest food companies in the world, some of which agreed to let us name them. 
now there it wasn't you know it wasn't quantified that these will produce you know x amount of of of, of revenue as a as a commitment or anything like that but it is a, a proof point right and so depending on on your it's really straightforward if you're a like a d2c brand and you can just point to sales um but depending on your business you know i think it's it's important to just like take a step back and think about what what the you know indicators of uh you know, like propensity for success, you know, really are for for your business, and to to tell tell your story about traction around around that, both qualitatively and quantitatively, where you can. Yeah, I think a, a key point you you and Shai are, are both touching upon is that Reg CF isn't some shortcut around the typical things you have to communicate or think about when you're going to raise money from outside investors. You still have to think about traction very much in the same way you would if you were approaching. Uh, traditional angels because without that you don't have the story now you may have a story that is primarily based on your team and your prior track record um, and you know LOI is in, in a B, B2B sense but you still have to have that story that is compelling and interesting not just from a, a social and philosophical standpoint but also from a, a business one 100%. A lot of founders uh, always kind of asking me like oh how should I how should I do this on WeFunder uh, you know, what terms should I do on WeFunder? My answer is often like, if WeFunder didn't exist, what would you do? Okay, you do a convertible note, great. 8 million valuation cap, 10% discount, 5% interest rate, great, right? It's like, how should I how should I pitch, pitch? Like, what should I emphasize in the pitch? Like, what? how would you, how would you write your pitch deck if you're pitching an angel group? Do, do the same thing, you know? Like, am I gonna be able to raise, I, I'm like, you know, kind of, consumer consumer kind of software company I, I I haven't launched yet. It was like, well that's probably gonna be tough for you to like persuade investors to part with their cash on if you're on WeFunder, just as it would be if you would make you know, trying to persuade investors to part with their cash if you're pitching them in an angel group. So oftentimes I think there's a lot of a lot of parallels. I think raising from you know, millions of people online, getting in front of WeFunders investors, being able to raise from friends and family, unaccredited investors, publicly promote. I do think we can raise it easy, make it easier. I think on the margins, we can kind of turn some what would be no's into yeses. Um, but at the end of the day, like if you just have a company that like investors on aren't ready to invest in, you're also going to find it hard to raise um, on a on an online uh, platform as well. All right, we have a bunch more questions. I'm going to skip around just to try to capture a couple more before we let you all go to respect your time. Um, biggest one here that we haven't touched upon yet, any restrictions on the types of terms, equity, convertible note, safe, or the type of stock? I can, I can answer that one. No, everything's fair game on WeFunder. We've had 90% equity, 10% debt on the loan side, rev shares, simple loans, equity side, safe, convertible note, price round. The key is, is there a lead investor that's gonna, you know, put a meaningful amount in on those terms. Does that terms work for you and the investor? If so, we can roll with it. Awesome. And I think the the last big one we have is around U.S. based uh, or international. Um, can you support companies that are formed outside of the U.S. and can you support newly formed uh, U.S. companies? Uh, for regulation crowdfunding, it's U.S. laws. It can only be used to fund U.S. based companies. Operations can be international, but company needs to be incorporated or registered in the US. Um, definitely new companies, totally fine. Um, if you're international, um, there are other kind of crowdfunding platforms in other countries. Actually, the EU rules are just kind of liberalizing. WeFund is about to uh, expand in the European market. On the investor side, you can ha have investors from anywhere in the world. So investors don't need to be based in the US. Um, but if you're raising and we fund it through regulation crowdfunding, you do need to be incorporated or registered in the US as a company. Awesome. Uh, and everybody else who I missed, I will put some of these together and send them out and write answers for the ones we've got answers for. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Dan, Chai, Johnny, thank you so much for being here. This was awesome. Uh, learned a ton. Uh, look forward to continuing to learn more. Um, and folks, again, we will send follow-up and uh, a video recording of this. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for having thanks, us, man. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye.